Welcome to Promote Profit Publish. I'm your host, Juliette Clark. And okay, full disclosure, today's guest is an actual, not just somebody I do business with, but a friend. She's one of my golf buddies. We both suck at it, but we love it. Love it. And she's a very avid skier too. So I will introduce her in a moment. I want to remind you to go over and check out the book club. It's Breakthrough Authors with an S book club.com. And our guest today is going to be one of the featured books. I believe in April. So um, you'll get to get to preview her book and also Breakthrough Author Magazine. You can go get it at BreakthroughAuthorMagazine.com. Our theme this year is Ditch the Middleman, Strategies to Bypass that 55% distributor fee. So actually keeping more money in your pocket from your book, because if you've published a book lately, probably noticed you're only getting a buck or two out of it. So, you know, we really want to maximize those ways for you to keep more in your pocket. So today's guest is Nancy Mayer, and she is not your typical strategic planning consultant. With a knack for shaking things up, she's carved out a niche as the go-to rebel for organizations ready to challenge the status quo. Merging her prowess in design thinking, visual storytelling, and gamification, Nancy crafts strategies that aren't just innovative, they're downright revolutionary. A thought leader, author, and relentless innovator, she believes in pushing boundaries and redefining possibilities with an unapologetic drive. Nancy is on a mission to propel organizations from the mundane to the extraordinary, one game-changing move at a time. So welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Juliet. Yes, we so are good friends. Here and the book is part of the free giveaway today. So um I have to tell you guys, Nancy has a book called the Advisory Board Playbook. And she's going to talk today with some concepts that might seem like they're a little over your head because they are revolutionary. But I want you to rest assured we are going to give you a URL at the very end that'll bring it all together. And it actually is going to download the third part of her book, which is more of the implementation. So just be aware of that if you feel like you're a little confused by this uh, interview. So Nancy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And um, I did write the book, The Advisory Board Playbook, and Juliet is my publisher, and we have been having a lot of fun doing it. The book's kind of in three parts. It's, uh, you know, what an advisory board is and isn't. It's all, The second part is my five-step process to actually building advisory boards. The third one is now that you're going to have this meeting, it's a very, very, very important that you do it right. When you have that, those many people around the table, you want to make sure that, you know, you optimize the time that you have with them. And that's where we're going to really kind of deep dive today is in that facilitation and games and strategy tactics, kind of getting everybody on the same page. I'm a big proponent of one page uh, uh, solutions. And then the last part of the book is kind of the th four different types of uh, advisory boards. So you have a strategic advisory board, which is more for, you know, business and strategy. You have a customer advisory board that actually helps you get feedback from your customers in a very fun and innovative way, playful way. There's actually not-for-profit advisory boards, but I believe people can be much more strategic about bringing the right people to the table and understanding that it is a, a voluntary position and, and the expectations are different. And then finally, like a peer advisory board, which is like, in my mind, those old style masterminds where you have seven or eight people who are committed to each other, who get together. And that's where you see more of the hot seats and things like that. But all the different techniques um, are in the book. But in particular, we're going to delve into the, the whole facilitation piece, because I think everybody here not only are authors, but your speakers. And I think there's some really fun ways to integrate games and play into your 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 talks and your interactions with your customers to, you know, just grow faster and get innovative solutions to whatever your biggest challenges are. And it's all kind of around strategy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Nancy, I could have used you last week. We had our first <laughs> we had our first meeting for an initiative and seven people in there and about three of them showed up with a different vision. And um, even though I had talked to them in advance and it was it, it was very illuminating, we actually had to pull back and somebody contacted me and they said, I felt so bad for you because 
obviously some people were bringing other things to the table. And what was interesting about it is I, I love what you're talking about because you could see there were kind of power plays going on with my idea. And I was, <laughs> I, I was a little bit offended and a little bit overwhelmed because it didn't really go where we thought. So we had to pull back. We created a survey this week. And so now we're going to look at the survey answers and figure out who's really good for this and who's not. So sometimes when you get all those people in a room, they're not on board. And and you and I had the same thing happen a couple of years ago when we brought a group, a group of people together at your house. We put together this great plan and then the leader didn't execute. So um, I'm going to go through a variety of what my favorite, some of my favorite facilitation tools. One of them that I highly recommend is called Liberating Structures. And it's kind of this way to create a structure without creating a structure. And there's about 12 different um, games or exercises that are in the book, Liberating Structures, but you can go to the website and then they, there's quite a few more. But there's one that I uh, really like, which is purpose to plant purpose, P2P, purpose. Uh, now, now I don't even have it in front of me. <laughs> But um, it, it's if you go to Liberating Structures, and it's a, a really great way to go through all the different steps so that everybody is on the same page with the, 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 the plan and the purpose of an uh, organization like yourselves. Okay. Yeah. So, no, what are some of the other ones that, that you put together? Because that it sounds like we were trying to use a liberating structure without actually knowing what one was. <laughs> so, within Liberating Structures, there's a, another framework because a lot of these are just different frameworks and it is called the storyboard and in the storyboard it actually allows you to use different elements of, of liberating structures to actually build out a meeting so depending on what the outcomes that you want for the meeting then you can reverse engineer and look at the different exercises or games or processes that you can go through to get you those actionable results and then getting everybody again on the same page because the p2p is a one page you end up with going through everything i mean i, I can pull it but uh yeah so liberating structures is great uh, one of my other favorite ones is innovation games and innovation games is really early stage marketing research. So again, you can use, there's discovery games and literally within an hour, you can uncover the number one problem that if you solve will give you the biggest bang for your buck. There's shaping games where you, you know, get your customers to tell you what are the must haves, what are the nice to haves. But what I love about shaping games is that there's a lot of blanks that allows them to give you ideas that you wouldn't otherwise see. Because I find sometimes we become overly sophisticated consumers of our own product and we think things are kind of intuitive and they might mm -hmm. not be to our customers. Um, right. Can I just stop you there with that one? Sure. You and I were just talking about Notion, and I thought that was such a, a great platform because it was intuitive for me. And yet, if I were to hand my Notion to you, it may not be intuitive for you. So that is such a great point is, you know, there's just that, that way your mind works that if you don't understand the way your client's mind works, you may be creating something that is just really off kilter for them. Right. So, you know, and then I'll just kind of finish up on that. And then we'll talk about canvases because, you know, you, you brought up a great point about understanding your customers and how you add value. And so um, the last innovation game that I love using are prioritization games. And so very often, if you have a tech company or if you're building different products, you have like new features and things that you were thinking about putting out, but you don't really know what's going to drive the highest value for your customers. So you kind of t-shirt size how expensive it's going to be to develop this new piece of software or this new product. And then based on the t-shirt size, you give it an arbitrary number. So a small might be $5, an extra large might be $25. And then you add it all up and you give your client, your customers about 45% of that budget. And they're going to tell you very, very quickly what drives the highest value for them by what they purchased. Now, the interesting thing about gamification and play it's a dopamine release so those clients actually 
have a dopamine release when they buy something virtually and it increases their propensity to buy it when they you actually put the product out because they want to replicate that that feeling so in between like a lot of games and these exercises there's these dopamine releases and you know that's what kind of drives gamification so like most people when they think of gamification they think of you know rewards right like you do this and you get this reward and there's a lot of loyalty programs challenge achievement reward that are based on that then there's the next level of gamification which is really when you um, do collaborative games so innovation games is kind of in that collaborative game realm and then the last one which is much more difficult to design and that's like more of those interactive games where you're you're playing a certain role in a safe space. And at the end, it's that idea of like, well, how did you play, right? Like, you know, and it allows you to make mistakes in a safe environment so that when you go out into the real world, you know, you've had some experience. And as we all know, like you do one thing once and it's scary and then you do it again. And then each time you do it, it becomes less and less scary. Yeah, so... Then, you know, kind of going back to thinking about your customers and how they think, I'm a big, big, big fan of the business model canvas and the value proposition canvas. In fact, I just have, <laughs> happen to have <laughs> one here. Um, and it was designed by Alexander Osterwalder and it actually answers the nine key questions that you need to answer for any business or any product. And once you map it out, it's this great opportunity then to do design thinking or prototype your business idea. Because I think too often we fall in love with our first idea and it might not be the best idea. And so then you know, it gives you this opportunity then to, to look at validating the assumptions with your customers before you, you know, spend a lot of money. Right. And this is where most people uncover foundational pivots that completely change their businesses. And, you know, so customer segments is one. But then this is the value proposition canvas. And you can see you have your, your customer over here over here and these are your products and services and what i recommend is that people just look at their customers separately before they try and plug in their product or solution and um you know look at what are the gains what are the pains what's that job to be done and there's like emotional jobs there's functional jobs and and it really allows you to kind of deep dive into your customer and make any pivots as you're doing your validating your assumptions. And again, you know, we would use the word pivot and, and that's really where a lot of pivots happen is by mapping this out. The next thing you can do is actually take <laughs> Can I stop you right there? So oh, um, you, you guys, <laughs> I cannot stress how important this is. We are putting together an AI book marketing course right now. And one of the things that when you're using AI is if you don't have a really solid grasp or description of that avatar, that customer, AI can't help you. Yeah. Because they're giving you answers based on input. And if your input, if you don't have that customer built, like Nancy's talking to, pains, you know, what's good, what's bad, and actually validate and test that, the AI you're using is not going to do you any good. Yeah. And then, and then a lot of times people talk about, you know, pivoting their, their avatar. And that's exactly where it comes from because you might not have that right, the right person. Or you might not be solving quite the right problem, problem for yeah. that person. Yeah. So sometimes you can have the wrong person, but sometimes you're solving the wrong problem. Right. That's why validation, I love that you were used that word validation is so important because people spend all this money, they get the idea, they put it together, but they haven't validated with the clients. So they're kind of shocked after they put this money in and nobody buys it. So that's where that validation is, asking those questions. You know, would you buy this? Um, we even sometimes test with a small buy 
um, on it to see if somebody will pull out a credit card and actually buy it. Because it's easy for me to say, yeah, Nancy, I'm going to buy it. But then you get it out there and I'm like, yeah, nah, I just, I told you that to make you feel good. <laughs> and, 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 you know, again, that's why focus groups can be so misleading as well. And, that, and going back to innovation games, it's such a unique, fun early stage marketing research that you can even do based on like just an idea. You don't actually have to have the, the product and it's very low cost, very high confidence because, you know, in the startup or business world, they're going to say, get outside the building and ask a bunch of questions. But again, people aren't very good at asking the right questions. So they, you know, it's low confidence, low cost. And then you can go right to the other side where you can spend millions of dollars, have your MVP, go into like a, a, a focus group with where everybody knows there's people behind that mirror looking at you and they will still, it's very hard to get past biases, but when you play and people are doing games, like the ones that I explained, the discovery games, the shaping games, and the prioritization games, they just get so into it and they start telling you way more things than you otherwise would. So that that's really one of my favorites. The other one that came up to me, uh, that came up for me is uh, the whole work of the Creative Problem Solving Institute. And they have a great framework as well. And what I like about that is, you know, you're talking about divergent thinking, coming up with lots and lots and lots of ideas. And then based on a certain criteria, you know, then you can start doing the convergent thinking and getting down to kind of the right ones. And what I love about the creative problem solving um, framework is that they have three exercises to make sure that you're solving the right problem before you start problem solving. So, I mean, that's something that I, I see a lot where people waste, you know, a lot of time. Oh, we spent hundreds of hours on this. It's like, yes, but you're solving the wrong problem. And yeah. um so again, you know, it's a, another great one page solution. Like I was saying that, you know, Canvas is a one page solution. And one of the other ones I know that uh, Juliet and I were talking about are, are kind of a shift, at least the shift that I see in when you're building your business around vision and mission. So a lot of times a vision is kind of like, we're going to get here in such and such a time, but it's, it's, it, not really detailed enough for people to understand. So we were talking uh, about the work of Cameron Harold, and it's called Vivid Vision. And it's very, very powerful. It's more than one page, but it, it's, it's the exercise as you go through and you envision what your company looks like in three years. There's a lot of, you know, um, trigger questions that, and, and, and mind mapping that you do, but what are people saying about you? Where's your head office? What kind of awards have you won? Who's working for you? Just as clear as you can, and then write it, you know, put it up, like get stickies, put it up, and then write, have it professionally copywritten and um, designed. And then this becomes so important for your whole value chain. And everybody now can help you get to where you want to go because you've been able to detail it so clearly. And mm -hmm. as your team grows or as your company grows, one of the things that he recommends is that you do a table read, kind of like in a, you would in a movie. And everybody reads a little section of this vivid vision. And the power of saying it aloud is incredible. And, you know, manifesting and, and, and making that vision a reality. You know, you know, that is so exciting. Um, for those of you who uh, got my author alchemy book, it sort of follows the same thing, Nancy, because what's cool is as you're, you know, you have this big three year vision and then you're doing those, you're writing down those little things that are going to get you there. And it is so motivational when you're able to cross one of those things off because you did it and now you're moving on and now you're realizing what a great manifester you are. So I love that as a 
an, an exercise to do. I know a lot of places where, uh, you know, I've been involved in, in work will have you write a, a customer vision or, you know, a vision of where you want to be in three years. You'll have you write letters to yourself. But I like this, this table reading. That sounds, that's yeah. actually your vision read out loud. How powerful. Yeah, very, very powerful. And then the other shift that I really like is going from a mission statement, which kind of is usually the why, to what uh, I call mission and guiding principle. And that's based on the work of uh, Donald Miller from Story Brand. Story Brand, yeah. And again, instead of just being a mission, it's like more like a tactical mission and how are we going to get there? And so thinking again, like, like a, a movie director, you're not just telling them, why and their motivation but you're also touching on you know the character and who that character needs to be and what those critical actions are so you you have like a little mini mission statement and then you have the you know the key characteristics that you want people to have on your team and then you have like the critical actions that they need to do every single day then you have a much bigger story and then the underlying theme is kind of the why but this is again an amazing one page tool that you can do that you can develop in a collaborative fun way with your group so maybe you know i can help you with the that that other group that you're doing that once you get that vision right we can get the the mission part but it becomes a very very valuable tool as well for recruiting people you know like yeah yeah, that's so interesting. So what do you do with implementation? Because we had that scenario where we went and we met with you as a group and then it went nowhere. What does that happen a lot? Or, you know, what what was what was that? What's where's that? How do you take it and then execute, I guess? Is well, I think that. it's again setting expectations, but there, you know, the, there is the like the, the project management side. So you've got the vision, you break it down into like, what are the key tasks that get done? And, you know, I'm, I love kind of this task board, which is again, a visual technique. And, you know, for each of the swim lanes, you break down what's the project, what are all the tasks to be done, and then allow the group to self-organize and take one of those tasks and put it in, I'm going to get this done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I find that, especially if you're like with a, a not-for-profit, you know, advisory board, it's just a great way to engage volunteers when people are, are doing something and they're not getting paid for it. But um, it has that kind of built in. So it's the task in progress done. So when I'm working with like a not-for-profit, I will make the volunteers sign a contract that I'm going to put in four hours a month, let's say, and they meet monthly. So all the tasks are four hours are divisible by four hours, and they have to take on four hours worth of tasks during that month. Then the best part is then you have the, the daily stand-up where you get back and you go, what did I get done? What am I doing next? What's standing in my way? So you have this built-in accountability where everyone has to stand up in front of their peers and say, what did I get done? And if they didn't get it done, what's the problem? Or what are they taking on next? But then when you celebrate every single time that you get one of those things done, that's how, you know, again, you get the dopamine release and you're going, Whoa, I'm excited and I want to do more. And that's in fact how you can increase velocity of your team to get to the execution. And um, yeah. Yeah. Did that answer the question? Yeah. yeah so again, it, it, it's it, kind of visual. You can use Trello. You can use other things. You, you can do these things online, but it's just the underlying of mapping it all out and then taking the most important things and breaking them into tasks and then getting people to self-assign their tasks, put their name on it, and then be able to stand in front of their peers. And, and then as a event manager or an, an executive director you can pick it pick up the balls if you have to but the experience for the volunteers or for the employees or for anybody that's part of the team is so much better because they get to a pick what they want to do they they're, they're getting things done they've been involved since the very beginning and you know so again that that whole overall visioning and what i like to do is, is start with a driving statement like why is this important putting it in context 
So I think perhaps maybe we didn't have an, uh, enough of a purpose. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I would agree. And I think the person that brought us together thought that the rest of us would do all the work and we were really relying on, on her. So I get that. I get that. Sometimes the, how do you say that? The idea is enthusiastically put out there, but the motivation to get it to execute is not there. And, and I think, you know, that kind of comes back to advisory boards or board of directors in that, you know, a lot of times if you don't have structures and you don't walk away with actionable plans that people have bought into, then, you know, it's just talk, 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 and nothing gets done. So, so you know, and you've got to be yes. so strategic about who you bring to the table too, like, you know, and, and, and set those expectations that you expect them to work. <laughs> yeah, it actually was a good thing that happened last week, because when we put the survey out, we actually are weeding some people out. We thought we were going in with seven partners. And now that we look at the vision, because we required that everybody bring a skill set to the table to help make this work collaboratively. And um, we got some people that were like, yeah, I have nothing to bring. So it's like, OK, well, you're not going to be bringing it then. <laughs> so Nancy, where do we get your free download? that's going to tell us more about this. Okay, so it's called play for the number four profit.com. Play for profit.com. And, yes, and uh, because I believe that when you add play, you power up profit. And I say play is actually essential <laughs> in business because first of all, become more creative. Creativity leads to better innovation. The second thing is kids how to problem solve through play. And, uh, you know, what business isn't about solving problems. And then again, socialization, you know, it's especially in this disconnected world, if you bringing together people and motivating them, you know, like you can, you know, play well together and, and, and just that whole socialization and having fun. I, I just, you know, if, if you're launching any project, anything, I would fight tooth and nail. I don't want to just like half a day. I need a whole day and I'm going to interject all these really fun interactive exercises. And that's how I've been able to take teams from forming to high perform performing very quickly. Yeah. Play also builds trust too, which I think there are a lot of, when you're disconnected, it's really hard to trust that your other, your other players and what you're doing are, are going to execute as well. So Nancy, play for the number four profit.com. And if somebody wanted to reach out to you, what's your email address or how, how do they contact you? Nancy M business at gmail.com or find me on LinkedIn. Okay, very good. Nancy Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. I know there's a ton yes. of ways to spell that. So thank you so much for being on today. My pleasure. And it was always so much fun to spend time with you, Juliet. Um, you are an inspiration. Oh, well, thank you. I'm going to bum you out. I'm looking out the window at the golf course and it's 51 degrees here today and people are golfing. Oh, we should we should be there. We shouldn't be on here. We should, we should I know. I know. And I was thinking maybe I could ride my motorcycle down there. <laughs> uh, I think it'd be a little cold for that. So, all right. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>